I'm sure there would be a very intense discussion, so let's not let's save every minute and uh, move to the next presentation, uh, which is um, again my colleague, friend, and collaborator, Professor Naren Rao. Uh, he works uh, he, Naren Rao, MD. He is MD in psychiatry from National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences. He has authored several papers and he's currently a faculty of the Department of Psychiatry. Professor Narayan. I would say uh, thanks to Dr. Sangeeta uh, for the invitation and uh, it's a privilege to speak to the August audience. Um, uh, half my job is made easier by Dr. John, who has given an uh, introduction to uh, the schizophrenia. Um, so continuing the tradition uh, of clinicians, I uh, will start with a clinical example like Dr. Prachiba current did, and then I will move on to the talk, uh, which will give the um, introduction to the talk. Um, so this was a narrative, narration by a patient with schizophrenia told that uh, I look out of the window and I think the garden looks nice. Till then things are fine. But then the thoughts of Andrews come into my mind. There are no other thoughts of mine there, only his. He treats my mind like a screen and flashes his thoughts onto it like a screen and flashes his thoughts like you flash a picture. That's one uh, narration. You have hundreds of such narrations. But a very, very common problem what you encounter in clinical practice when you're treating patient is the reluctance of the patient to take any kind of treatment. So this is one of the patients who told me, Doctor, believe me, I have no problem. That was the first thing she told when he came into the clinic. What I'm telling you is very true. Over a course of interview, you told, ISF Pakistan has given money to my office people who want to kill me as I'm the most important person. And had a lot of paranoia, so told, I'll tell you the secret only if you're going to keep this as secret. And then he told the obvious thing, that I'm the one who made Narendra Modi Prime Minister of India this time. Okay, yeah. And what kind of help you want from us? For that he told, I don't have any problem, I will not take any medication. Actually, it's my wife who has the problem. So I'm just accompanying her. And this is a very, very common clinical scenario. The family members bring them, telling them that I have some problem, I have to meet some doctor. So it's actually uh, in the disguise of treating uh, the wife, the wife had brought the uh, patient. Uh, but have this in mind, uh, we'll get back to it later, which is the very classical example of uh, what is so obvious to others that it is false but the patient fails to recognize that what they are thinking is actually false. So this will be the outline of my presentation. Uh, initially, we will look into some of the concepts of metacognition and for this presentation, what I mean by metacognition because there are different versions. And um, then we will look into the neural correlates of self-reflection and what is its relevance in schizophrenia and then I'll present some of the ongoing work on neural correlates of metacognitive deficits in schizophrenia and what are the possible links with, with other domains of cognitive dysfunctions and the possible future directions. So human is a social animal um, and social interactions are very, very fundamental to human development as well as survival. For example, most of our uh, routine work, our day-to-day -day interactions are actually social and our career, our family relationships, our caring for children, you take any example, it's actually determined by the social interaction as much as it's determined by your technical skill or the cognitive function. So social interactions are very fundamental uh, for human development and survival and it's a complex interaction. For example, when two people are speaking to each other, um, the person who is listening to the person who is speaking has to actually perceive what the other person is trying to convey and has to interpret what was what he perceived was correct or not and then generate an actual response which is appropriate to the situation, to the person and also keeping in his mind uh, what is good for the person who is giving the response. So it, though it is an automatic event, uh, it involves a lot of uh, separate steps like 
if it is a verbal communication versus non verbal but most of our communications are both verbal and non verbal so you need to decide what's the emotion which is uh, which the person is expressing so you need to perceive not only the cognition but also the emotion and also interpret both the emotion whether it is matching with what the person is telling is there a deception involved and then generate a response which is actually appropriate to that situation so what happens in the foreground is that but what happens in the background is at the same time you are processing these emotions or the what the person is trying to convey you through communication you are also trying to understand what is the intention why this person is speaking like this and what is the disposition what is he capable of doing and what is the behavior so humans have evolved over a period of time a sophisticated way to come up in evolution over other species as well as within the species we always want to strive further so our social interactions are more and more complex which has a evolutionary significance as well so to handle this we have a very very well developed system which is present in us which handles the interaction with others but at the same time when we are interacting with others we are constantly also scrutinizing what we are doing so the other interaction is actually very very um, mutual because we constantly scrutinize our behavior by the cues which we get from others and what we are expressing is also also determines how the others interact with us so the social interaction gives us a very good avenue to look into both the self and the other and to handle this we have an excellent system about thinking about the thinking this unique ability is the one which i will be focusing more known as the metacognition so as i mentioned it involves the perceiving interpreting and generating responses to intentions dispositions and behaviors of oneself and others for example when i am giving the talk i am constantly observing what may be the response of the audience so i am scrutinizing my behavior based on the cues from you and at the same time you are scrutinizing my behavior uh, whether i am giving an appropriate response or not so this involves two aspects that is thinking about one's own thinking or you need to reflect about your own self thinking that is the self reflection or the self reflectness and thinking about the others thinking which we have discussed yesterday and also was uh, alluded by dr pratibha karant in the previous talk about the social cognition so i'll primarily focus on the first part uh, about the neural correlates because i understand a lot has already been discussed and the social cognition has been present but the problem why it is not always thought over is that the knowledge of our own mind seems so intuitive that the importance of this metacognitive functions is underscored only by the loss of those functions and that is where the picture of schizophrenia comes in because schizophrenia gives a classical example of this breach of knowledge of our own mind which is so intuitive so just to give you an example of our own uh, automatic functions which we assume or accept um, as automatic uh, which are so fundamental okay so one of them is the mirror test which you all majority of you may know uh, which has been present from so this is greek mythology of narcissus who fell in love after seeing his own reflection in the water but we are moving into a society which is uh, significantly preoccupied with looking into our own images uh, with all the selfie cameras uh, uh, but uh, the ability to recognize our own self in a mirror is so intuitive that even a child who is 18 year 18 months old can actually recognize the image of his or her own as the same person but this ability is drastically absent in all animals other than the primates and among the primates only the chimpanzees and are proven to have always and monkeys and gorillas there are been a conflicting um, evidence whether they can recognize they cannot recognize but nonetheless it takes lot of time you would have seen many monkeys jumping out of the vehicle seeing their own reflection on the uh, in the mirror uh, so just to give you an example of how it's important as you could see it has been studied in schizophrenia and the visual perception during mirror gazing one's own face is um, abnormal even in um, schizophrenia so some of the functions which we take as automatic 
uh, and we never bother to think their functions becomes very, very important or the importance of these functions are underscored only when they are absent. As Dr. Pratimba Karant also alluded, uh, some of the functions which are very absent in autism. So I will briefly look into neural correlates of metacognition um, because uh, we'll have a um, detailed talk by Dr. Garg in the evening about neuroimaging of self. Uh, so we have the authority to speak in the evening. So I won't be going into the details. I will just give a glimpse of uh, what we see in healthy and then I will move into our work, what we are doing in schizophrenia. So the neural correlates of self-reflection, people have examined this using different methods. Um, one of the main reason or the challenge to examine this is uh, that because it is so fundamental, if it is completely absent, it may not help in survival. So you may not have a very good model right from the beginning. So one of, so you need to go to the pathology to examine these physiological functions if it is so fundamental. So one example which before the advent of the investigative modalities was with the frontal leukotomies. So this was a treatment in which the frontal lobes because they were considered to be silent uh, regions of the brain were taken off for multiple psychiatric conditions and people started observing that these people start showing multiple behavioral problems though they don't have any motor problems following the surgeries and one of the uh, important observation which was made was that these people start losing a socially appropriate behavior as well as they start losing their ability to think of and reflect about their own thinking or they don't feel embarrassed when they don't think properly. Uh, then there are structural MRI studies which have examined what are all the um, uh, different brain regions which are structurally abnormal and which may correlate with uh, these uh, metacognitive functions. But the major change has happened after the advent of functional MRI because that gives you uh, a unique opportunity to examine the brain function in a real time. Uh, functional MRI has two components. One is the resting state as well as the task MRI. Both have been used to examine the self-reflection. Uh, look into the task MRI in which the you make the person to perform a task inside the scanner and then take the pictures of the brain so that you can examine what happens. Uh, so two kinds of tasks have been used. One is the reflection on the task performance and the reflection on the personality quality. So the, the problem with the metacognition is it's not your task performance or the task which is important. What the person thinks about the task what he is performing, what he or she is performing. So that is important. So for to do this, two examples I'm showing in which um, this is primarily based on the reflection on the task performance, one's own task performance. So in this, uh, you show the individual two screens in which only one screen has a alternate uh, intensity. Okay, the intensity of this patch is more than the rest of the patch. And then you ask the person what was in which screen was the intensity different. So the person responds telling that it was in the first or the second. So this is a regular visual perception task. The metacognition comes when you ask how confident you are about this or in which one you actually thought how over a scale of uh, one to six if you want to rate how confident about your own decision which you made. So that's, that gives you an avenue to enter into the uh, metacognition. A similar one which is, which is again, so um, it's a very, very shady picture but if you look closely you will see either a face or a house. So the picture is purposefully made very much blurred to put, an, um, put a stress on the person so that you ask the person whether you see a face or the house and in this there is actually a face so that if the person responds by giving it as a face. Then after a time, you ask the person how confident you are in the decision of making it as a face. And then uh, that gives you an example of when, the, when you make the person to think about their own performance which they did. So this is reflection on the task performance which will give you uh, an indication about the metacognition. But in psychiatric literature, what we are more interested in is about what the person thinks about his own self. Him, he or she as a person, what is the personality quality and this is a common paradigm which has been used to make the person to think about their own self or their own quality. 
So you give a stimulus, for example, ask the person, does this word describe you? So that you are making the person to think about their own personality and you need a control task. So you ask whether is this a desirable trait or not. Okay. So you give a different stimulus or the same stimuli and then ask the person. And does this word describe any famous person or is this word printed in uppercase or lowercase? So this is a common paradigm which is used because so that you are actually trying to control whether the cognitive functions underlying when you are thinking about your own self is very much different when you are thinking about a semantic, just looking at the language function because all the stimuli, other characters are going to be the same or when you think about your own self, is it different from what you expect in others? Okay, What you expect in an ad, another human being as a desirable trait or not or as a desirable quality or not. So you start thinking about the another human being, okay, other human beings in general or it could be a, some famous personality like maybe Manmohan Singh uh, or any other prime minister or your or somebody who is very closely emotionally linked to you as one of your family member, maybe your mother, maybe your father or kid. Okay. So you try to see what the person uh, does or what the brain of this person does when the person is trying to uh, engage in different activities. So uh, this is this has been examined in multiple studies um, and uh, the summary of findings in healthy using both the stressing state and the task based literature is that cortical midline structures are the most important structure for self reflection. Uh, it's predominantly the medial prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, in particular perigenial and the subgenial anterior cingulate cortex and then you have the posterior uh, midline cortical structures like the posterior cingulate cortex, precuneus and retrospinal cortex. There are other um, um, areas which are not midline which also gets activated in few paradigms. Um, like the superior temporal sulcus, insula and the temporal pole. So this gives you a uh, schematic uh, representation of, uh, so, so this is the midline of the brain and these are the brain regions. Uh, um, so the pitch regions which are marked in the red are the ventral parts of this midline cortical structures, primarily the medial orbitofrontal cortex, subgenual, perigenial ACC, ventral sub supracalosal ACC. And then you have these regions which are the posterior parts of the midline cortical structures, uh, posterior cingulate cortex, precuneus and the retrosplenial cortex. So these are the brain regions which are primarily involved in when one is thinking about their own self and reflecting on their own self. Uh, so that's with the task based one. What is important is when the person is not doing anything, you are doing a resting state brain fMRI, you are not asking the person to do anything but you just make the person to lie down and ask them not to think anything in particular, not to focus their thoughts, let their thoughts start to wander. Uh, then also you see a multiple brain regions, primarily multiple brain circuits which starts uh, functioning which gets lighted up and uh, uh, there is a good amount of overlap between uh, the self thinking and the other thinking and the resting state brain networks but there is also some regions which are exclusively or more gets activated when somebody is thinking about their own self and this is one of the main region like the perigenial anterior cingulate cortex which gets uh, activated um, when somebody is thinking about their own self. Uh, um, so I'll just throw a piece of information because the, uh, this is, uh, I'll get back to this at the end, um, uh, that there is um, a separate brain network for the social cognition, but as you could see, it's all the same brain regions which gets activated when you are thinking about the, your own self or with the others, but there are some brain regions which gets exclusively activated when you are thinking in social cognition, like the temporoparietal junction or the amygdala or the anterior insula, which becomes more important for the social cognition. But you have a good amount of overlap in rest of the brain regions in both self thinking as well as the uh, when you are thinking about the others and in particular medial prefrontal cortex is one brain region which gets lighted up in both this. So, uh, so, 
you have self reflection some regions which are exclusive like the posterior cortical midline structures and you have some regions which are exclusive for social cognition but you have other brain regions which are common for both these functions of whether you are thinking about your own self or whether you are thinking about someone else's thinking. Okay. So, so with this background we wanted to examine whether the neural networks in schizophrenia are actually abnormal or not. So why schizophrenia? Because it's one of the common psychiatric condition and um, Rip John has already mentioned and given a detailed account of the hallucinations and delusions. But these form primarily what we call as positive symptoms. You have a lot of other symptoms, negative symptoms and cognitive symptoms. But for this talk what is more important is schizophrenia patients classically demonstrate abnormalities in social cognition as well as abnormalities in self disturbance and few people have even hypothesized that the disturbance in the self perception could actually be a core disturbance in schizophrenia. So you have a model which actually gives both forms of metacognition the self as well as the other in the form of social cognition. So that was the reason to choose schizophrenia and in schizophrenia you have a lot of self disturbances you have heard about the self-awareness uh, and the self-agency and uh, um, how the hierarchy of the agency comes. But you also have a lot of disturbance in the self-boundary. So for example, patients with schizophrenia have a breach in their ego boundary. Their thinking or their body can actually be uh, controlled by others. Um, for example, this is a narration by one of the patients who told that it's my hand and arm which move and my fingers pick up the pen but I don't control them. I sit there watching them move and they are quite independent. I am just a puppet who is manipulated by cosmic strings. It's not only the body but also the emotion which gets altered. I cry, tears roll down my cheeks and I look unhappy but it's not me who is unhappy but they are projecting unhappiness onto my, my brain. And this is what I mentioned in the beginning that someone else is trying to project the thoughts into the mind. So you have a breach in body, emotion as well as the cognitive self. But what is striking across all symptoms whether it is delusions, hallucinations or these self disturbances is that the person cannot stand back and look, hey what am I thinking? How is it going to be possible? Is it possible or am I thinking something odd? So that ability is something which is dramatically decreased or in many patients in a majority it is completely absent that they are not able to reflect on their own self. They are unable to distance themselves and assess their abnormal experiences objectively and many times if you give an alternate explanation they are quite resistant to accept the alternate explanation to what they think and that has a major implication because as a rule then an exception most of them are reluctant to accept any form of treatment when they are significantly uh, symptomatic. Uh, these phenomena are not exclusive to schizophrenia but what is striking is that the ability or inability to distance themselves from these phenomena. For example you have another condition called Charles Bonnet syndrome in which a person loses the vision the person has a normal vision and suddenly loses the vision, they start experiencing the visual hallucinations which could be very very much vivid like a old place they visited or some geographical location. Okay. The person is actually having a visual hallucination okay. but at the same time the person knows that what I am seeing is not real but I cannot see because I don't have the vision. Okay. So the person tells that I see the images okay, but I am not seeing them. Okay, so the person has an insight which is preserved in that and you have alien hand syndrome in which the person lacks the ability to control one of the arm. Okay. The arm starts moving by itself. Some people describe initially as, as though it mimics schizophrenia and some of them were misdiagnosed as having schizophrenia initially that uh, uh, my hand is not in my control but the person is very much aware that it is their own hand and at the same time after detailed explanation or detailed clarification many patients tell that I don't have control but I know that it's my arm and many times you will see them holding their other hand and they give a different 
name to the hand many times in negative connotation okay that are sometimes they may call my mischievous hand so but it's never that they lose the insight so the charles bonnet syndrome actually gives you a very classical example of the importance of the metacognition um, so in schizophrenia we measure the metacognition or self reflection using different uh, uh, instruments one of the commonly used instrument is the beck's cognitive insight scale which is the and um, um, this has two subcomponents, which is what we are currently using. One is the self-reflectiveness, which has nine items, and then you have another uh, subcomponent called self-certainty, which has six items. So some of the examples of the questions which are asked are uh, trying to examine I mean, how they reflect on their own self. For example, I have jumped to conclusions too fast. They have to give an ex I guess yes or no, or over a scale of zero to three. Or sometimes my interpretations of my experiences are definitely right. Or some of my experiences that have seemed very real may have been due to my imagination. So that will give you an example of how, what this person is processing or how he, is, he or she is uh, uh, thinking about uh, their experiences or their thinking. Uh, so what we are currently doing is uh, to examine the neural correlates of this self-reflection in schizophrenia patients using both structural MRI and the functional MRI. Uh, we are using both resting state and the task based uh, to that. So one of the main region which we are focusing is called the frontal pole or the BA10 which is the anterior most portion of the frontal cortex which is evolutionarily uh, very well developed in human beings. We have almost twice the size of the chimpanzees of this particular area. So, And this brain region doesn't get activated in any other task. So that's the beauty of the brain region that this is a silent brain region whenever somebody is doing any other attention task. So this doesn't get activated and one of the proposed role of this brain region is also that it may be actually a supervisory role of controlling rest of the brain regions uh, when they are working or when you are doing a re self-reflection. So we wanted to examine um, the uh, structural uh, uh, brain abnormality in patients with schizophrenia. Uh, so 18 patients we have completed with 20 healthy controls all underwent uh, a structural MRI scan. All of them had a Beck's cognitive insight scale and we, the idea was to see whether there is a relation between their self-reflection and the self-certainty and the volume of this uh, brain region. So, uh, so, uh, so my colleague uh, Vikas uh, uh, painfully took uh, time to delineate uh, each of the brains in different slices. Uh, so it's a manual morphometry using a method with uh, Dr. John developed few years back uh, uh, of how to delineate this particular brain region. Um, and uh, so this is what uh, we have at present. Um, so in healthy, uh, when we look into the brain region, okay, they have a um, negative correlation with the self-certainty, uh, which again goes that higher the brain region, you have less of a self-certainty and higher of a self-reflection. Uh, this gives you a schematic representation um, of uh, the scatter plot. The y-axis uh, tells you the self's certainty subscore and the volume of the right uh, B A10 is uh, shown in the uh, x-axis. So more the uh, volume of the uh, B A10, less is the self-certainty because the self-reflectiveness and self-certainty goes in the opposite direction. But in patients, what we also found was that higher the volume of the BA10, better is their self-reflection. That is, those patients who have significant abnormality in the, this brain region also have very little self-reflection. So there was a direct correlation, and this is the uh, scatter plot. Uh, um, uh, the y-axis is reflected by the uh, self-reflectiveness uh, subscore, and uh, the x-axis uh, shows the volume of the uh, uh, BA10. And as you could see, as one has higher volumes, they also have a higher score on the self-reflectiveness. So this uh, indicates that uh, the, this particular brain region may actually play a significant role in reflecting on one's own thinking. Uh, so we're still uh, collecting the data to increase the power and then to uh, see whether uh, we get any other interesting findings. Um, so this is a group uh, uh, put together both patients and controls and uh, it still holds good that if somebody has a higher volume of the uh, BA10, they have a uh, uh, better self-reflectiveness. Um, so 
moving from structure to function, I'll give you a brief glimpse of our ongoing work on using the functional MRI to examine the uh, self-reflective abnormality in uh, uh, schizophrenia. So this is the uh, uh, fMRI uh, setup, I'm sure you know, so that we administer the task inside the scanner, which I accept, uh, explained earlier, uh, the self-reflection task in which you ask the person to reflect on their own personality as well as to reflect on someone else's personality, uh, or is it a desirable trait, and then you analyze the uh, scans. So we collected uh, 20 healthy controls and 18 patients with uh, schizophrenia. All underwent a, a fMRI scan with a visual stimuli and the responses were collected using the uh, button, res button response. As this was an English uh, language task, all patient uh, and the healthy controls had at least 12 years of formal education and we did a uh, interview uh, before the task to make sure that they have an ability to understand the stimulus word and the task was actually administered once to them beforehand to make sure that they understand and if any clarification was required about the meaning of the word it was clarified. We were presented in upper case and half in lower case. They had four conditions. One was self-reflection that is whether the word describes you one was the other reflection where the word describes mother, one was the whether it's a desirable character or not, and the fourth one was a control of whether the word is printed in uppercase or lowercase, just to make sure that they understand the instructions and are actually participating. So this is how the task looked. You asked whether the word describes you and show multiple words, six words in a block design, and then you ask the person whether is this a desirable trait and present six words. So half of them were presented in lowercase and half were presented in uppercase in each block. And all the words were matched for uh, their length and frequency of usage so that uh, other language related uh, uh, measures were taken care. And this is our preliminary results, what we have now. When, you, when the person is doing a self-reflection and compare that with the other reflection, that's the effect labeling, the controls and patients were compared as a group and as you could see, the patients had decreased the, in the activation in right inferior frontal gyrax, that's BA9, which is very close to the BA10, and in the left anterior cingulate gyrus, as you could see clearly the perigenual anterior cingulate gyrus, which has been very well implicated in self-reflection and in the left medial frontal gyrus. So uh, patients have a normal or decreased functioning or decrease in the activation of this uh, particular brain region. And on the other hand, they have aberrant activation mainly in the posterior brain regions, like in the precuneus and in the left postcentral gyrus or in the right inferior parietal lobule. So they have a decreased activation in the anterior brain regions, whereas they have a heightened activation in the posterior brain regions. Um, uh, I'll skip that. This is the summary of our findings. Primarily, we found a direct correlation between the frontal pole volume and the self-reflectiveness score. Higher the volume, greater the score. And patients have decreased activation in the right and left medial frontal cortex while performing a self-reflection task compared to control. And patients have increased activation in the most of the posterior midline cortical structures. Uh, so just the last two minutes about what we are currently trying to do and how do we link both the self-reflection and social cognition and the schizophrenia. Uh, so the, uh, as I mentioned, schizophrenia has a uh, known abnormality in the social cognition. So one of the paradigm premise in which we're planning to work is using a simulation theory that one powerful strategy for inferring the mental state of other person is to imagine one's own thoughts, feelings, or behaviors in a similar situation, or what's commonly called as walking in other's shoe, or walking in one's shoe. And um, what's interesting is the extent of this simulation is dependent on the degree to which self and the other are perceived to be similar. So if you ask me, what do you think the other person will do? First I will think whether I am similar to the other person, or the, whether the other person is similar to me. And then if they are similar, I may think they may, he or she may think same like me. Or on the other hand, if I perceive that the other person is dissimilar, we may think different. So one common link possibly is in the medial prefrontal cortex because it's involved in both self-reflection and social cognition. And uh, there is 
preliminary reports from few studies which have told that there is a double dissociation within the medial prefrontal cortex that when you ask somebody to mentalize about a similar other, it involves the ventromedial prefrontal cortex which is linked to the self-reflective thought and when you ask the person to mentalize about a dissimilar other, it actually in involves the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex. So, you have a double dissociation within the medial prefrontal cortex in ventral and the dorsal parts when, they, when you are mentalizing about a similar versus a dissimilar. Uh, and this is a meta-analysis of all the fMRI studies uh, which showed the self and other judgment uh, which again shows a spatial gradient for mentalizing in the uh, medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, the green regions which are the self and the magenta regions are for the uh, others when you compare the self versus uh, uh, others. And in uh, schizophrenia another uh, hypothesis which has been proposed which we are currently examining is also whether within the cortical midline structures itself you have a dissociation for the self reflection as well as uh, for the social cognition that is whether the anterior midline, cortical midline structures are important, impaired in self-referential processing and whether the posterior cortical midline structures are impaired in social cognition. So, uh, our interest in, into this uh, hypothesis is based on our preliminary finding in which we are finding uh, a decrease in the anterior cortical midline structure activation at the same time increase in the posterior cortical midline structure uh, activation. So, we are currently trying to examine uh, this uh, uh, using a simultaneous examination of both self-reflection and social cognition in the same individual when they are performing a social cognition task as well as the self-reflection task on the same day uh, using fMRI. Uh, but most of the literature is primarily based on uh, uh, the fMRI literature. We have very little cue about what may be the neurochemical basis of uh, self-reflectiveness. Um, um, whether any particular neurotransmitter is involved and I think Dr. Garg will speak about it in the evening um, and what are the effect of medications. So, uh, surprisingly, um, none of the medications have a major role in altering the self-reflection. Uh, though with the face of the illness, the insight fluctuates significantly or the self-reflection changes, we don't know whether any particular medication or whether any particular neurotransmitter has a specific uh, um, uh, advantage in treating the metacognitive deficits. So, uh, to conclude, before I conclude, I thank uh, my team. Um, so, Apita is the core person uh, who's running the show. Actually, I'm just presenting the uh, data. So, she did all the task-based fMRI and Vikas is currently doing a, his MBBS, uh, uh, but he's out of his own interest, he is doing most of the structural MRI analysis uh, and correlating that with the BCS and Ranjini is doing the uh, resting state uh, uh, changes uh, and its relation with the uh, self-reflection. Uh, we will have the data very soon. Yeah, and I thank my funding uh, uh, funding agencies uh, who helped this as well as uh, my institutes uh, which allowed me to perform the work. Thanks for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nareen. Uh, now we move on to the final presentation of this session, which is by Professor Owen Flanagan. Uh, he, is, he is James B. Duke Distinguished University Professor at Duke University. And actually, he is one of the most well-known experts in philosophy of mind, moral psychology, and cross-cultural philosophy. Owen. Thank you. Um, there's a handout. I, I, I don't think I know how to get my small little PowerPoint called up. So there is a handout, which is kind of a long handout, but it might, um, it might help you. And I think it was passed out er, um, earlier. So these, uh, the slides are really uh, uh, gratuitous. Uh, there's not much on them, but there's a lot on the, uh, on the handout. So uh, you can read along or not. Let me just make some preliminary um, comments about um, my work and my interest. I, I've been interested in consciousness uh, actually since the last century, so I think that makes me um, part of the, um, the old guard here. And um, I always thought, uh, um, so today I'm going to talk really about um, some recent work of mine, but I want to actually connect it up with some um, older work that I did back in the 80s and the 90s. 
So uh, like many philosophers, uh, they say uh, for us, uh, Aristotle tells us that philosophy begins in wonder, wondering about things. And uh, uh, so three great mysteries, uh, and one of which is relevant to today's, are these. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there anything at all? Why wasn't the, the default state of the universe there being absolutely nothing? Um, so this is a question about origins. Um, and some people have um, some ideas about why there's something rather than nothing, but it usually starts this way. Uh, once upon a time, there was a singularity 14 billion years ago, and it banged. And that's why there's something. Uh, well, uh, that is one answer to the question why there is something rather than nothing. But for at least philosophers, it leaves us a little bit worried about why was the singularity this very compressed piece of matter um, there in the first place, and why did it bang? Um, in any case, uh, it's still common to tell the story in terms of astrophysics uh, that there was this bang. And then sometime uh, in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, uh, uh, there's, there, there, comes upon, there comes an answer to our second question. The second great mystery is why, why is there living stuff? Because we know that for the first 10 billion years of the universe, you could have explained everything with the resources of physics and inorganic chemistry. But sometime about four billion years ago, there started to develop unicellular organisms, living things, actually probably not, a plant life of some sort. So suddenly there was living stuff and you suddenly needed the sciences like organic chemistry and biology to explain things. And then later on, when we don't know exactly, there became sentient living things and that's the third mystery. Why, are there, why is there consciousness? Why are there creatures for whom there is something it is like to be them? Now we just heard wonderful talks about what it's like to be autistic, for example, some kind of exploration of an inner life of autistic people, not that they're all of one kind, but the different kind of phenomenologies that autistic people have, or the different kinds of phenomenologies, the different kinds of what it's likeness to be a schizophrenic. Um, and for each and every type of person there is, uh, there's a really interesting, important phenomenological question of what it's like to be like that. Now. Um, just one other point. I, in my own work, I've always been inspired uh, by what science can teach us. So with respect to the question of why did some living stuff become conscious, I always, in the spirit of Darwin, thought along these lines. There must have been a time when some of the living stuff, yesterday we were talking about amoeba being sensitive to noxious stimulation. Well, clearly, plant life is what I used to call informationally sensitive. It's sensitive to what's going on in the environment. So plants pick up nitrogen, um, but they try not to pick up some other things, noxious stimuli. So they're sensitive to what's going on in their environment. And clearly, a lot of unicellular organisms are sensitive to light. Uh, we know that they're light sensitive, and they move towards or away from light. <clears throat> I take it that once upon a time, something happened, probably a biological mutation, such that some critter, some living thing, had the first experience. Um, where the first experience, I suspect, was either an experience of pain or experience of visual, a visual experience. The reason I sometimes say visual, well, you can see how pain would be really useful. And then once you had it, if you could pass it on, it would just be tremendously um, helpful to an organism. The reason I sometimes think it has to do with vision is because we know that photoreceptor cells, the kind that we have on our eyes, were invented at least 75 different times independently by evolution. So having photoreceptor cells in a, in a light-rich environment is a really terrific thing. And that may be in other, and of course we're visually, at least humans are visually um, highly dominated creatures. In any case, I don't think we know the answers to any of those three mysterious questions. We don't know why the singularity banged. Um, we don't actually have a full explanation of how life emerged. Um, and we certainly don't have an explanation of uh, how, how and why consciousness emerged, whether it's good for us, uh, uh, what domains is good for us, probably not all kinds of consciousness are good for us. Today, though, I'm going to talk about something. Given that there are conscious creatures, like all of us in this room, dogs and cats, monkeys and cows, um, I'm going to talk about something that's specifically uh, of interest to me about human uh, consciousness. And it has to do with variation across cultures. Um, uh, among different ways in which we experience ourselves, okay? This is not about 
um, individual, there's huge amounts of individual variation. But what I decided to do about 10 years ago, well, actually it goes back about 20 years, I, I kept watching what psychologists were saying and anthropologists were saying about differences in the way people across cultures self-conceive. Now, one reason this interested me also has to do with, and this is a major motivation, um, ever since I started my teaching career, um, I've been members of psychology departments and, uh, or neurobiology departments. I'm still a member of both um, psychology and neuroscience and neurobiology. And you probably say this at your psychology departments too, but I, I was used to hearing this back into the late 1970s. We better hope that college sophomores are representative because almost all psychological knowledge is based on college sophomores. Now, um, um, and I would tease my friends uh, about this, especially as, as psychology moved to neuroscience. So I've been there when psychology used to be called just psychology, and then they started to rename themselves cognitive scientists for a while, and now my psychology department is called psychology and neuroscience, even though most of the people only know where the brain is, not anything about it. Um, but I watched this transition, and the same thing has come up with respect to the representativeness of college sophomores with my friends who do fMRI all the time. So I say to them, how are you, how are you controlling for the fact that 25% of our students at Duke University are on SSRIs, and another 15% are on Adderall, and another 10% abuse drugs? So you're putting brains of people who are not, as it were, uh, completely normal um, uh, into these machines. Well, in 2010, a very important paper was published answering my question about um, how representative are college sophomores. And many of you may know it, and if you don't know it, you should know about it. It's, it was in the Behavioral and Brain Sciences in 2010 by a team of psychologists from uh, University of British Columbia who asked that question. They said, how representative um, are um, uh, college sophomores? And their answer was this. First of all, up until 2007 when they measured, ni over 90% of all psychological research published in all psychological journals was done on North American students. Over 90%, okay? So this article was called The Weirdest People in the World, where weird st stood for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. Now this is disturbing if you are, you're concerned, as all scientists are supposed to be, about representative samples, okay? And then they ask the next question. So the first study was how, how, where, where are subjects coming from where we base psychological knowledge on them? First answer, over 90% of the studies on North American students. Um, the rest are weird nations, Israel, Australia. Okay, you get the idea how this would work. So places in the North Atlantic. Their next question was, how representative are these people, uh, given that we know modern humans came to be about 250,000 years ago, literacy is only 5,000 years old, and democracies, et cetera, are relatively recent. Their answer was, this is the least representative group in the history of humankind. You'd be better off with cave persons. Okay, now that's not actually just to sort of make, uh, it, it, I think this is a very, very serious problem in terms of the state of what we know about the nature of persons because if psychology is supposed to tell us what is the nature of humans, then we want to know from resources beyond just a, one small segment of an unrepresentative group of people. Okay, so that led me then to think about um, extending my work on consciousness to think about um, uh, variations in the way people experience themselves based on cultural differences. So what I've been doing for the last while, I just finished a book called The Geography of Morals, which will be out next year, is assembling the best I could information from psychological anthropology, from anthropology about differences among people. And this is a continuing interest of mine doing work in sort of what we can learn from cross-cultural philosophy, from transcultural philosophy, as we sometimes call it, and so on. So now I'm going to go through, and this is on your handout. So there are 12 of these. I'm mostly just going to introduce these today, but I'll say some tantalizing things about um, how I think we ought to, maybe tantalizing, for discussion period. And I'll try to stop very much on time so we have lots of time for discussion. OK, so I think I gave you all the background stuff. OK, so these are 12 um, self-variations. I actually have 13, but I decided 13 is an unlucky number, so I wouldn't talk about it. <laughs> 
but if you want to know what it is, I could tell you later. Okay, the, the first self-variation is a deep, sort of what philosophers say, the metaphysical question. What is it that is the subject of experience? And here, there's disagreement among professionals. For example, there's disagreement among philosophers, neuroscientists, theologians, as well as among ordinary people, just people on the street, uh, over what is the subject of experience. What I am, where I am, and how I came to be, what my fate is. Now, what I'm calling the philosopher's self is almost always, in most cultures, tied in with a soteriology, a theory of salvation, or an eschatology, as they call it, usually in Western theology. It's about who am I now and what will become of me? You know, uh, this is related to the question of personal identity. I was, I'm the same guy that I was 10 years ago, and I'm the same guy I was 20 years ago, and I'm the same guy that I'll be in 20 years, and maybe if I die and go to heaven, I'm that same guy too. And what is it that makes me that subject of experience that can continue in that way? So some of the um, candidates are, of course, from different cultural traditions, uh, Greek psyche, anima, nephesh, nafes, these are Jewish and Muslim names, atman, or anatman, okay? Now this, this is the side where the philosopher self is usually aligned with spiritual traditions which are, in, are, I'll just say, immaterialistic, or they're not physicalistic, right? That whatever the essence of you is that makes you you over time, it's something that is not completely reducible to your body. Now, but there's disagreement about this. Then there are, say, physicalists and neuroscientists who will say, no, um, what makes you you is that you're a continuous human organism or your brain makes you you, or some part of your brain. This used to be a, an idea people were gonna say, we're gonna locate the seat of the self in some part of the brain where you suddenly take that part out and no one's home. Well, we'll hear a discussion of this uh, type of topic later on. Um, uh, so other people say it has to do with um, uh, a part of your brain, or some people just say, even neuroscientists, will say, there is no you, you, there's an illusion. It's a user illusion that you are the same person over time, but what's really going on is that your memory is so effective in reappropriating your memories, it makes you think that you're more continuous than you are. And that would be closer to the Anatman view, but from a physicalistic um, perspective. And some people in circles that I run in think that um, each of us is a simulation in the matrix run by the artificial intelligentsia. But anyway, that's another um, option. So that's the philosopher self, and people in my tribe usually say, and that's our business. We'll take care of that, thank you very much. <laughs> that's for the philosophers to figure out. <clears throat> okay. Um, a second entirely different, oh, and by the way, for each of these selves, the topic of our conference is consciousness, cognition, and culture. What I'm saying, what I'm talking about here, these selves that I'm talking about are not entirely conscious such that a subject could just report, oh, I introspect and I see that I'm res cogitans, that was Descartes, you know? Or I see that myself is completely embodied in my brain. These are not things we're self-conscious of, these are part of what some philosophers call the inescapable framework. We're usually brought up in a tradition, a cultural tradition, and then we start to think, even if not consciously, so that's the cognition part, in terms of these larger worldviews, uh, that Im embedded view of the self. The second uh, uh, self um, variation is one that's discovered by anthropologists. And by the way, I give the references on the handout to some of these. I should, I should just caution you, in, I'm not endorsing uh, for some of these that I'm convinced that there is this distinction in the form that the anthropologists or the psychologists are saying it is. I tried to be careful to pick good research that's, re that's well received, but I'm not in every case saying that I get it, they're right on. Okay, so here's the porous and non-porous self. Clifford Geertz, Geertz, the great anthropologist, writes that the standard Western conception of the person is, and I quote, a bounded, unique, more or less integrated motivational and cognitive universe a dynamic center of awareness, emotion, judgment, and organized into a distinctive whole and set contrastively against other such wholes and against a social and natural background." End quote. Now, Geertz was studying Javanese, Balinese, in each and every case, by the way, it makes a big difference what the contrastive case is. But I'm, I'll try to be careful about that as I go along just to tell you what the contrast is. So Geertz is an American, he's contrasting 
what he takes to be the dominant sort of view of the self in America, which some philosophers, actually Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor calls atomism. Each of us views ourselves as a self-contained, talk about boundaries of the self, okay, self-contained organism, and my fate is mine alone, and uh, 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 my freedom is mine alone. You hear this in political discourse also. Anyway, he says that you don't see that in Java, Bali, and Indonesia. Now, there's a lot of work by um, uh, social, by cultural psychologists which claim to find this again and again. It's an interesting question whether global capitalism will be the end of these differences. Some people think it already is starting to erode these differences. And, um, uh, but, but for example, uh, Richard Schwader has done a lot of work in temple towns in India. Um, uh, uh, but Marcus and Kitayama have done a lot of work with Japanese, um, Chinese, and uh, Taiwanese. And they say the distinction is usually drawn this way. Some selves in the world, and I'll speak for, I'll say, some weird people, some weird people, okay, have this kind of independent self. And other people have what in the psychologists call interdependent selves. They'll define their well-being much more in terms of certain relations they're having with other people. So this is a common, uh, this has been discussed a lot in political philosophy about liberal self versus communitarian self and so on over the years. But there's a substantial number of findings, at least uh, finding that weird people, people in the North Atlantic on one side, and East Asians, some degree South Asians, some Amerindians, the original people of the Americas, uh, and Africans on the other side, and I've given a bunch of references here. So those, that's a different, now notice this is a, the porous and non-porous self is presumably has to do with the way one experiences oneself and one's wheel and woe and one's fate in life as dependent or not dependent on other people, okay? And their claim is that there are cultural differences um, here. Okay, the third uh, distinction, self-constitution. Many psychologists, I'm sorry, um, North Americans uh, experience their traits of character as in them, inside themselves, as traits they have. I am shy, adventurous, creative, or whatever some personality test says I am, okay? So I'm either introspective, you know, perception, I forget there's these Myers-Briggs personality inventories or whatever you could take, and then I have those traits in me. The finding again and again, at least this goes back to Schwader and Born's work in Orissa in India, is that you find much less, at least in, um, uh, in this was a temple town in uh, India or in, in, in East Asia generally, that people don't define themselves as possessing certain traits, but usually use trait descriptions as relational. So they'll say, I'm friendly to her, and I'm quiet and reserved to them. Okay, but I don't possess a general trait of being a friendly person. And Americans will uh, very much speak in this language of, oh, the person you're gonna introduce me at the party, what's she like? And then you're supposed to give these general descriptions of the person's character, okay? And so this is a, this is a, a, a common finding. It goes back into the 70s that people are finding again and again. Okay, um, so that's self-constitution. What kind of, whether the traits are in me, whether they're highly malleable in terms of relations and environment. The fourth, um, uh, case is what I call story selves. Many psychologists and philosophers, Jerome Brunner, Paul Ricoeur, Alistair McIntyre, say that selves are essentially narrative. That narrative is the essential genre for self-making, self-understanding, and self-representing. So here's the idea, is just that um, some philosophers have just put it this way. We're just storytelling creatures, and the stories of our lives have a beginning and a middle and an end. And if we meet, I better be able to tell you sort of the story. Oh, I'm on a podium. Uh, Shoo, uh, that was almost. <laughs> um, uh, if, I, if I tell you the story of my life, I should be able to tell you more or less an accurate story of who I am and where I've come from and what I'm like going forward. Now, some philosophers, actually, Galen Strawson, among them, has said that actually he thinks this doesn't apply to all people. And he actually thinks of himself, he says, as an episodic person. And he thinks there are a lot of people like this who don't actually, even among people who tend to know how to tell stories of their lives, don't identify themselves with their past self, nor do they identify themselves with much with their future self. Now, some people immediately respond, this is reckless, you're morally abhorrent, I don't want to be around you, <laughs> okay? But an interesting question is whether or not there are within um, uh, even weird cultures 
uh, variations in people, whether they can feel that they connect with their past selves or don't connect with their past selves. And there's some anthropological evidence that there are cultural differences in this way. So I, uh, in uh, a few years ago, visited among some people in the Amazon called the Ashwar Indians. They were headhunters until the 1980s. You can see that they're not headhunters now. Um, uh, and uh, these people were very, very interesting. They live in the Amazon in groups of no larger than 150. Um, when they get larger than that, they separate up. And uh, they uh, have no history that they tell of themselves. Uh, they have no art. They have a little music. Uh, they're not interested in the past. Another group like this is the Piraha of the Amazon also, which Daniel um, Everett has written about in a book called Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. And this is a wonderful story, you, just to get a, a view of how presentist these selves are. Um, Everett went down there to do um, one way that linguists get the uh, uh, scoop on a, a language that's never been written in America is they send Christian missionaries to groups, and they must learn the language first, write a grammar, and then they translate the Gospels into that language and then convert the people. Well, Everett tells a wonderful story of he gets to the point, he's learned the language, he has uh, gotten to the point of translating the um, Gospel of Matthew, I think it was, and then he brings it to the local council of the Piraha, and they say, so do you know Jesus? He said, no. Does your mother know Jesus? No. Well, then we're not going to talk about Jesus. Thank you very much. And he found this again and again about these people. Their epistemology was completely, actually, a little bit like maybe the chimpanzees. It was very here and now, very presentist, no historical sense. But these are, these are homo sapiens just like us in every other respect. But this is huge cultural variation in um, their, uh, whether they're historical beings or not. OK. Then, um, oh, that was the first slide that you missed, see? The next four uh, self variations, again, uh, we're talking about that are in the literature. This one is obvious, virtuous selves, and I've been working on this uh, uh, for a long time, but, and it's sort of obvious, but maybe it's underestimated a lot. The quality of a person and, and their character, the goodness of a self, is normally across the globe thought to be a function of virtue. Where by virtue, I'm not committing myself to a specific kind of ethical theory. I just mean there's usually char characteristics of a person that will say, make her a good person, OK? But these are known to be culturally uh, variable. Uh, for example, um, uh, compassion or karuna is, is the highest virtue among Buddhists. Maybe compassion and loving kindness, metta, are the two highest virtues. That does not appear on any American list. In America, justice as fairness is pretty clearly the highest virtue. Or freedom. Uh, something like that, sort of you hear that among libertarian sort of groups. But it's not, you, you, but compassion or loving kindness will just not be on our radar as in the top set of virtues. Um, or something like in, um, in uh, Confucian uh, tradition, filial piety, try to teach that to American children. It just doesn't work. So there are these real differences, or another one would be uh, ahimsa, right, nonviolence in uh, uh, the uh, Hindu tradition. This is just not something, you know, uh, that, in fact, there would be resistance in America to teaching that, that to the children because we count on being a militaristic people and uh, that would uh, cause trouble. So, so these, so, so notice how the, the way in which a culture teaches the youth what it means to be a good person and how you're faring in relation to those ideals, that will also constitute yourself. It's part of the inescapable penumbra. Um, or framework. Um, ideal emotional selves. Now this is kind of interesting. Um, so uh, children's books in different cultures and subcultures, this is good work done by Jeannie Tsai, who's at Stanford. Um, uh, so one way to think about how you're acculturating children and, and proposing to them what kind of person you want to be when you grow up is to look at children's books. Uh, and uh, so she's done a lot of work um, in America, where she is stationed in Taiwan, where she's from, in Hong Kong, and in uh, Japan, certain places in Japan. And she's also done comparisons between the books that Christians and Buddhists teach the, with their children in various places in the world. So here's one of the, her major findings. American books model a face that she calls HAP, 
high arousal positive hap face, okay? Uh, it's very distinctive. For those of you who are American, you know the face. It's what I call happy, happy, joy, joy, click your heels. <laughs> the kids make it, and they're trained to make it. It's very superficial. It's extremely superficial. It fits ver perfectly with a kind of individualism uh, and uh, self-satisfaction, a smug satisfaction that you're a master or mistress of the universe. And it just is a, it's a kind of bizarre um, face. Um, uh, whereas um, she says that, um, Jeannie says, um, that uh, Buddhist books, this is not all that surprising, uh, model low arousal positive faces. Those are called lap faces, technically, right? Uh, a look of calm, uh, and they endorse internal serenity and equanimity. So you're raising kids right from the get-go to sort of model and think about themselves going forward normatively in utterly different ways um, via these mechanisms of socialization. And presumably, you're calling therefore out the self to become a certain kind of self. Not, obviously, we can't explore all the possibility spaces for being selves, but this is just one way we direct them. Okay, um, the next one, ideal, Oh, I just talked about ideal emotional states. Here's another one, um, um, authentic and inauthentic selves. North Americans value a kind of what we would call authenticity. Um, uh, that is, this involves something like being true to one's personal values, more highly than, for example, East Asians, who think that a good person often stands down from her personal self-preferences when the collective or the tradition demands it. And you'd have to think, when I say, when I refer to specific groups, that's just what the research talks about. You'd have to think about whether this would be true of South Asians, whether it be true in India. I don't, I wouldn't um, dare speak to that. But the idea is that it's permissible and thought to be a normatively good thing, in America at least, to stand up to authorities, your parents or whatever, at a certain point and do what you want to do. And in East Asian culture, um, this is quite familiar, at least for me, from living in China for a while. Um, uh, you're not. Uh, re filial piety and respect for your elders is a certain, um, uh, requires you to step down sometimes for your own desires. And you can see how that goes with the atomism of the very first point. Number eight, self-reference. When four to six-year-old children in America and China are asked to report on daily events, the proportion of self-reference is, now catch this, three times greater among the Americans. Three times greater. American fo kids focus on what I did and what happened to me. American children report fewer events overall. Like if, so if, if parents ask the kid when he came home from school, kindergarten, okay, what happened at school today? American children, three times more than the Chinese children, tell you about what I did. They report fewer events overall. They will almost never be able to tell you what the other kids did or what the teacher did, okay. Um, uh, the American children also make twice as many references as the Chinese children to their own internal states, not just to their own doings and deeds. So they don't always say things like, we played ball. We said, I wanted to play ball, and we played ball. Okay? So there's a lot of reference to internal, to ego, to desire, and so on. Um, uh, and therefore, to what I wanted, to whether my desires were met or thwarted, whether my feelings and my emotions were what they exactly they were. Self-recognition. Did I, let's see, this is number, oh, self-reference, okay, so now we go on. So here are the last four. And as I say, I'm really going to, I'm bring, introducing these and then going to throw them out for uh, discussion. Okay, self-recognition. Americans prefer jobs in which personal initiative is encouraged and individual merit is rewarded and publicly acknowledged. There's a lot of research that Americans will take jobs, you know, college students, the ones on Adderall, <laughs> SSRIs, and are very competitive. If you, ask, if you tell, give students hypothetical scenarios, you can make $40,000 at a company where you won't be as happy, where you can make 39000 and be much happier. They'll take $40,000. Okay. Um, so uh, Americans prefer jobs, North Americans, in which personal initiative is encouraged and individual merit is rewarded and publicly acknowledged. Japanese and Singaporeans do not, and Europeans are intermediate. That's, now these are older results. These are 1993, but um, I don't know if these have been uh, replicated uh, recently. North Americans also believe that individuals can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. More than individuals in other cultures believe this. In fact, there's wonderful work. Americans believe more than anyone else uh, that luck is not a big determiner of uh, how one does in life. 
so this is uh, very much, um, much more than uh, Europeans. And this is, it, I think this helps explain a lot why Americans uh, don't favor the welfare state nearly as much as Europeans will, and so on and so forth. Okay, self-comprehension. Indians, Chinese, and Koreans are less susceptible than Americans to the fundamental attribution error. Uh, those of you who are not psychologists uh, uh, who will know this, the fundamental attribution error involves overrating the causal influence of stable character traits and underestimating situational or contextual factors. So an American is more likely to infer from an individual act of kindness. So suppose either they or that someone they observe uh, gives a dollar to a homeless person. Americans are more likely to infer that that person is a generous person, period. Okay, that they'll do this reliably across situations, uh, whereas um, Indians, Chinese, and, and Koreans uh, do not make that um, inference. They are more likely to understand that this could be quite situationally specific. And that goes back to one of the uh, points earlier. Um, so now 11, self-serving bias. North Americans are more prone than Amer Indians, Mexicans, Fujians, Southern Italians, and East e Asians to the self-serving bias. Self-serving bias is thinking that one is better across very di various dimensions than others. So there's a common, there's an American radio show called uh, Garrison Keeler and Lake Wobegon or something like that. And he calls it the Lake Wobegon effect because Americans are very prone to thinking, if asked, that they're in the fi top five percentile in terms of looks, intelligence, et cetera, and so are their friends. Okay, and this is called the self-serving bias. It does a lot of um, problematic work um, uh, in um, social life. And finally, last but not least, positive self-illusions. Now, the way these work, these are, these are uh, studies that go back to the 80s, but they keep, keep being replicated. Um, North Americans are more prone than people of other cultures to believe that they are in control of outcomes. So, uh, for example, uh, that certain people believe that they can control the sex of a baby by uh, rolling dice or something like that. Um, winning lotteries, or that bad things, getting cancer, divorced, or in car accidents, and so on, won't befall them, then is sensible given the base rates that they're told. <coughs> Technically positive illusions are illusions. They involve making mistakes, but they're good mistakes, the positive part. Um, and uh, so let me just give an example of how these work. So a common technique um, used at the beginning of college in the United States is you gather the students together, like in an auditorium like this, the brand new students, and you say, um, we're gonna teach you a little bit about um, uh, safety. So for example, you tell students things like, 10% of the students who drink uh, in their first year of college end up hospitalized for drinking too much. And most car accidents are caused by drunk driving, and you give them statistics. And then you say, and for sexually transmitted diseases, you should wear, be careful and make sure you have protection, and so on and so forth. For some of these, they'll give base rates. So they might tell young people, one in eight women in this audience will get breast cancer, and it's never too early to start watching your, for your breast health. And one in eight men will get prostate cancer, and it's never too early to watch, start watching for your, pro, your prostate health. Okay, This is sort of public information that will be given to the students. Then afterwards, you ask the students, what is the probability that you will get breast cancer or prostate cancer? I'm just wrap it up. Yeah, perfect. And what they find is that students, now obviously some people should know that they're at a lower risk or a higher risk because of family history, right? But overall, in a large enough population that's representative, you should get back the base rate. You should get back that the group thinks it's about um, a one in eight. But in fact, you get much lower than that. People are optimists. They think that they won't, these things won't happen to them at the base rate. Same thing for getting in car accidents, getting divorced, or anything else. So once they look into the texture of these things, they find out the following, that the, um, there is a group of people who are realists, that is, at least among North Americans, who hit the base rates on the head, but they also turn out to be moderately depressed. The people who have the positive illusions, like don't think that these bad things are gonna happen to them, are happy. Now this is disturbing if you like are trained in philosophy where you say the good, the true, and the beautiful are supposed to go together. This looks like a case where believing what's false is good for you. 
So this has been a sort of a puzzle for a long time. But the recent findings on these uh, findings are that they don't cr transfer as well across cultures. So you're just not seeing as much positive illusions uh, outside of weird cultures, especially North America, uh, as uh, we've been seeing for a long time. Now here's the, so here's the question, okay, that I leave you with. Um, uh, are, these, are, are these just differences, or has someone made a mistake, you might say? You could ask for each and every one of these um, questions. Um, uh, um, clearly, there are differences. At least what I'm arguing today is that the way in which different people in different places in the world experience themselves show variation. They show variation in terms of the background, um, uh, uh, histories of the cultures, cultural attitudes, social norms, uh, religious traditions, and so on. But then you might wonder, well, what's, what's going on? Now, the first three self-variations, the one about the philosopher self, whether, whether uh, I'm porous or not, you could say that those have to do with the ultimate metaphysical architecture or psychobiological architecture of the mind. And therefore, you might think that if philosophers are doing their work, they should be able to tell us the answer to the first question, what is the self, what is the subject of experience? And you might think, well, maybe the psychologist can tell us whether there's anything uh, that is the way a person is deep down inside beneath the clothes of culture, psychobiologically, the way something like a normal person is put together. Uh, and then we could fix in outliers. Um, so maybe, maybe those are uh, universal type questions. The next four cell variations, though, and those would be the ones that have to do with um, uh, whether or not uh, the self is constituted by particular character traits or whether it's situationally very variable, whether or not you are a narrative self who thinks of yourself as continuous over time or think of yourself more episodically. Um, whether or not um, a certain set of virtues are the right virtues that a self should have. So that, for example, you say, oh, the Buddhists are just confused. I'm sorry to point to you, but I happen to have one right here in the front. You just say, they're mistaken. Okay, compassion and loving kindness, eh, they're okay for Buddhists. But then you say some other list, like Aristotle's list is the right one, or the Catholic list is the right one, something like that. Um, the, the trouble with, but if you think about, but you might just say, well, those next four, no one's made a mistake. Those are just interesting cultural differences, and we better understand them if we're going to be able to communicate in multicultural cosmopolitan worlds, where people are coming from, how they differ, and so on. The last five self-variations, though, the ones that have to do with self-reference. Remember, the American kids talk three times as much about themselves. Self-recognition, Americans liking jobs that uh, call out their personal talents and abilities. And especially things like the self-serving bias and positive self-illusions, those actually look like straightforward um, uh, ways of thinking that involve either accurately or not accurately catching on to the way you are embedded in the world. I mean, a positive illusion is an illusion, after all. And you might just say, so those cases might involve mistakes being made by a certain people. And if you think that, the people who make them most are weird people. So we have something to learn. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Owen. I think uh, now we have very extensive, very complex, and perhaps almost mind-boggling uh, perspectives about the self. And therefore, now we open for discussion, and we follow the same method. People who have questions would come here on the aisle near the microphone and uh, kindly, kindly make your questions very brief so that we can have a wide range of questions and more discussion. So please make your questions brief, please. Uh, let's begin with uh, Ricky Suri. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, for Professor Narin Rao, and I've written it down. It's kind of very much. Uh, so, number one is why is schizophrenia considered pathological, and why does it need to be treated? What does treatment involve? What are the side effects of the treatment? And then, specifically, when you talked about the Charles Bonnet syndrome, which I've never heard of. Uh, you mentioned that there are, it almost seemed like these people were dreaming while they were, while they were awake as opposed to many of us who dream while we are asleep. So uh, this recalled to mind two specific issues, uh, incidents. One is of a 
Keralaite Christian lady who had a vision of Ramana Maharishi uh, calling her and so then she, when she woke up she actually went and did it but she had it when it was asleep so I guess it was normal uh, if she had had it when she was awake maybe it would have been schizophrenic and another is uh, a woman to whom Sai Baba came in her sleep you know similar spiritual vision so I mean these people are normal but I guess if you dream when you're waking up you're schizophrenic so that's the question <laughs> okay okay um, okay the first question uh, um, so we treat patients because uh, they have both personal distress or they are significantly dysfunctional okay so that's the criteria we choose when we treat the person okay so either for any psychiatric disorder the disturbance should cause a personal distress or a dysfunction okay many times uh, with patients with schizophrenia there may not be a personal distress in some of them but there is a significant dysfunction that the person is not able to optimally function uh, to his or her own potential or to what is expected in the society okay so either to the self or to the others there is a harm so that's when it requires a treatment uh, so uh, the treatment primarily involves medications which target dopamine and uh, uh, neurotransmission and it has different side effects depending on the medication which is used uh, the second question is uh, uh, interesting. Uh, the Charles Bonnet syndrome, the difference is, uh, see, uh, uh, so the, the difference is what is perception and what is actually your thinking or imagination. Okay. For example, if I say um, a movie actor, the picture comes into your mind. Okay. You're not seeing the picture. Okay. So if you're seeing the person of the, or the movie actor, then it is uh, uh, the perception. Or, but if it comes only in your mind, the image, okay, then it's uh, your imagination. Okay, so the difference is uh, in the Charles Bonnet syndrome, they actually see, or in schizophrenia patients, they actually perceive either voices or the thing. So it's a real perception, which is a false perception. So that's the major difference. Uh, er, er, Mr. Suri, let's please be compassionate to the other people. Uh, the young lady here, please introduce yourself and make your question brief. Yes. Good afternoon, I'm Priya Prasad, and my question is for Dr. Karanth. Um, so Dr. Karanth, uh, you spoke about autism extensively, and uh, my question is, is there any correlation, if not a causal relation, um, uh, in, in um, societies which have or do not have autism? For instance, do you f are there any studies which show that there is autism in primitive, like tribal societies and stuff like that? Uh, and I mean, are there studies like that? And if there are, if there is, or there is no such people, is there any causal or a correlation aspect about the society that people live in and autism? So I guess that's yeah. my. Uh, the brief answer is not that I know of. Okay. Uh, earlier, we used to think that the incidence is lower in countries like ours, but uh, it now seems clear that it's there across the world. I don't know about primitive tribes and people like that. Okay. I don't think studies have been done. But if you're coming, comparing India to the West. No, not India, just no. primitive tribes. No, I, I, I don't know of any work done in primitive tribes. Okay. Am I allowed to ask one question? No, no. Oh, thank you. Afterwards. Adolfo Garcia. <laughs> Hello. I am clinical psychologist working for almost 30 years with uh, schizophrenic people. Uh, and some of these years with children with heart, uh, heart disease, heart mental diseases. Uh, I'd like to speak with, with oh, not too much order, but some, some impression and some disser dissertations about, the, about your interventions. I think uh, about the autism, for example, the child in the first in the first video is angry. Tito is dancing. Uh, other, the other the other person is an artist. Uh, they, they are another manner to to see this disturbed people. I think in the interventions uh, you say, Pratiba, 
I will add uh, psychotherapy, both individual and group psychotherapy, and work with parents. Um, I think there they are many kinds of autism people, but the majority, they used to be very intelligent and sensitive. I think in the autism, uh, in psychosis in general, uh, people have uh, a hidden observer in the sense of, of Hilgar spoke about people who is who is in hypnosis, they are they are always a hidden observer who is is seeing all to pass. Consciousness is 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 never lost. And I think in schizophrenia, in my patients, there are, they are, there is a hidden observer who not lost the, the health consciousness. Uh, my patients, they are in cases. They are men and women with a large experience in their life. If we study some norm, normal person, uh, we measure uh, him or her physio physiological correlates, uh, we can encounter many variations. And um, if that is hard, if we, if we study people that had religious or yogi or trans experiences. I don't know what, what could happen if we study these people. Uh, a patient, I will finish uh, with the, the words of a patient who, who said, I cannot speak to my therapist because all I speak is writing in my clinical history. Right. Thank you thank, very much. Thank you, Adolfo. Thank you very much. And I think it's a comment, and perhaps we can reflect upon that later. Is that OK? All right. Okay. Yes, please. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Ovijit. Uh, actually, my question is to Sir John Pijon. Uh, in your lecture, you have told that uh, the patients uh, who is doing the hallucination, uh, actually, they know uh, that they are hallucinating. So if they know, then why? I mean, they are not developing a uh, corrective mechanism uh, towards, uh, I mean, that feedback mechanism to hold that, yeah, I'm hallucinating, I, did, I have to stop it. So does, I mean, do they do not have uh, the inhibitory <coughs> neurons that is inhibiting their thoughts or their hallucination? I think it's a very good question. I think uh, it's important to understand what is hallucination as opposed to what is other, what, what are other perceptions uh, which are not uh, considered as hallucinations. In uh, hallucinations, <laughs> the patient, the individual experiencing the hallucination, for him it's a real percept. He does not say that I'm hallucinating. He says that I'm hearing people talking to me, and there are people talking to me. I may not see them, but they are talking to me from a distance of one kilometer, maybe from London, from New York, but they are real people talking to me, and I'm listening to those uh, conversations. So for them, the corrective measure is to ask those people to stop talking if uh, these experiences are distressing for him. So what we would measure during the fMRI experiment would be that do, after the hallucination attention um, task or the, after the hallucination attention block, there would be a query block, a query a slide wherein we ask the individual, were you listening to people where we, I mean, because we would, we would have evaluated them prior to the fMRI um, experiment. So we know what the, is the content of those voices. So were you listening to those people talking to you during the last one block? And if they say yes, for more than 50% of the time, then they are hallucinators. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and please make the question brief. Shubrata Chattopadhyay. I am a physician and bioethicist, and my question uh, is to uh, Professor Owen Flanagan. 
thank you very much for your very thought provoking and insightful presentation uh, in bioethics philosophers of western tradition tend to undermine the notion of culture and they tend to reduce cultural differences to individual differences and the problem is that there is over emphasis on the notion of self over the society and the family and it has a bearing on the way medicine is practiced rather individual autonomy is kind of sacrosanct over family autonomy and i have a serious problem with the notion of uh, individual autonomy when it reigns supreme over family autonomy uh, what would you like to comment on this so uh, you make a very good point that uh, one might say that immediately when one focuses on the self, one is already leaning towards something like an individualistic conception of things. So one, you're right, would have to be careful about that. Um, the, um, I take it that your suggestion that there would be differences between uh, either individuals or groups. We don't have to make it even as large as culture, but let's just say that there are some individuals who view their own autonomy as an individual independent of their membership in any other group, a family, a town, a village, or whatever, as key. Now, I take it that's a difference in uh, something like uh, in values that one has. I'm not sure if there'd be anything at the level of basic psychobiology or the metaphysics of self that would determine that the answer to that question. I take it that that's more something that each culture sort of resolves internal to itself. Then, then one can, of course, still do cross-cultural work and look at how cultures that emphasize individuals and their well-being over ones that emphasize cultural units do. One finding, I didn't mention this, is this that cultures which are more porous, that individuals view their well-being as more co-constituted by how they do, but plus how their family does, how their village does, how their city does, how their nation state does, versus ones that are more really individualistic, like they're not doing so well, but that's not, that doesn't matter to me. I'm doing great. Thank you very much for that. All right, thank you. Please introduce yourself, sir. My name is Vinod Deshmukh. I'm a neurologist by training. My question is for Dr. Naren. The precuneous <coughs> region is very interesting. Not only it is part of the department network, but it's also a hub for our sense of happiness, or feeling of happiness. Recent work has shown that. Also, there is our experience of taste, sweet taste especially, is in a similar region on the medial prefrontal medial parietal cord. So my question is whether you looked into <coughs> in the sense of uh, happiness or feeling of happiness and sense of taste, is there any change in patients with schizophrenia? Uh, thanks for the question. It's quite interesting. Uh, but we didn't look into the happiness. Uh, uh, there's some literature which has looked into whether schizophrenia patients are more happy and whether it's related. But we didn't look. Though what we have done is we have looked into how depressed they are. Maybe we could go back and look into whether there is any relationship with the inverse relationship with the depression. Because we have the depression scores, but we don't have their happiness scores. But we'll look into that. Thanks. Also the sense of taste. Yeah, we didn't test their sense of taste, but we'll make a note from... Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shankar Rajaraman. Yeah, uh, I'm Shankar. I'm a psychiatrist and a student at, uh, doctor student at NIAS. <coughs> I have two small questions which I have written down. Uh, if Is self a natural kind or a non-natural kind? If selves are constructed in the context of interaction with the society and if there are different societies, how is one justified in finding a universal biological substrate for self? Uh, since culture is an important subtopic of the conference, I would like to ask the psychiatrists among the panelists uh, if they have looked into indigenous theories of thought and perception to get an indigenous understanding of delusions and hallucinations. 
I will answer the first, uh, Dr. Janu will answer about delusion and hallucination. Yeah. So I totally agree. Um, maybe we are looking into at uh, multiple levels, that's what I think. Uh, the biological constraint will primarily work at the basic level, but on top of that you have a lot of other things which will come into the picture as uh, uh, Dr. Frangen was uh, pointing out last time. Okay. So your biology may not be able to explain all variations, okay, definitely. But so uh, the simple analogy which comes to my mind is you have a hard disk, on top of that whatever the software you load it is different. Okay. But if the hard disk is corrupted you get lost many things. But just the hard disk will not be able to explain multiple softwares what you have. So I think we are working at a different levels. So the biological or the core self concept, some of them are maybe universally same. But on top of that, it gets modified because of the modulatory effects of multiple cultures, upbringing and different environmental factors. I think uh, understanding of delusions and hallucinations in the uh, cultural perspective. Um, Luckily in psychiatry uh, and in uh, uh, psychology, the basic tool for assessing individual experiences, be it normal or abnormal experiences, is the phenomenological inquiry, which is a philosophical uh, position that the, uh, the mental health professional takes. And this w would be to understand the patient's private experiences within the context of his, his own personal background within the context of his educational, family, and cultural background. So if you were to evaluate um, any of the internal experiences, which are normal or abnormal of any individual, you are adopting a position, uh, a phenomenological position, which will give us, uh, which should give us uh, uh, an indigenous cultural understanding. So, I mean, there is, in, 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 in my uh, opinion, there is no need for a separate, uh, uh, you know, uh, model to evaluate delusions and hallucinations because you already have the model. Thank you. Uh, Tabosh Dutta, brief question, please. Yes. Uh, this is to Dr. Flanagan. Um, in ascribing uh, causes to the difference in cultures between the perception of these different selves, uh, usually nature, that is uh, uh, the genetics and so on, and nurture is ascribed the regions, the environment and so on. I think uh, a biased omission is that of uh, reincarnation and transmigration of the soul and the samskara memories in the body, which can explain a lot of things. And there are proofs which are uh, given by uh, Satwan Pastricha, Ian Stevenson, others working in these fields. My question to you is, have you, you know, modeled or can, uh, used this kind of, you know, reincarnatory models to uh, explain things that are not explainable by nature and nurture, generally? Um, the answer, the quick answer uh, to your, this very provocative question. But, um, so, I myself am very interested in the fact that there's some really good anthropological work that shows again and again that if a karmic, what's called a karmic eschatology, a karmic eschatology is something like you get in Hinduism, certain brands of Buddhism, but you also get in the Abrahamic traditions where when you die, you go somewhere else. And it's both in all these cases, where you go, your survival is based on the moral quality of your life. Whenever one of those eschatologies meets one that's not like that, it wins culturally. I personally think, though because I'm a philosophical naturalist, that that's one of those really interesting cases where there's a cultural view which is probably false but is so attractive, partly because consciousness, having our consciousness and wanting it to go on is such a powerful urge. But I don't think, for reasons that have to do with my own philosophical orientation, which is naturalistic, um, I, I think that we're, we're animals, and therefore I think we should think that our fate is the fate of animals, that consciousness dies, decays, and disperses when the body does. So, but we can't argue that here, yeah. Yes, please, please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Krishna. Uh, my question is to you, sir, uh, Professor John. What do you think of uh, automatic writing and phenomena <coughs> such as that, wherein people get visions under the influence of maybe psychedelics or uh, higher meditative states? So where do you think this information is coming from? 
automatic writing. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm not uh, an expert at that. Uh, I can talk about uh, patients with schizophrenia. Um, the, there is a phenomenon called MADE phenomenon, uh, in, which is uh, described in patients with schizophrenia, wherein the patient would describe that I am doing a particular motor act, but I am not the one. I am not the person who is doing it. Somebody else is making me to do it, um, and I don't have any control over what I am doing because I am just a passive recipient of this person's command. I mean, not commands, but uh, the the um, the actions, and I am just moving my hand. I think uh, Naren has just uh, illustrated that in a couple of uh, the patient's own self reports. So there, here, again, the problem uh, that we are referring to is the issue of self-agency. And the, the, of course, we all know that you know, a person who uh, observes the individual knows that the patient is writing. But then the, the, the patient ascribes the agency to an external force. So therefore, it is our contention that the, the corollary discharge mechanisms, especially related to thought and movement and emotions, are deranged and perhaps superior parietal lobule and its connections with the other brain regions, as we have referred to, it, especially those of the internal awareness, awareness <coughs> circuit, may be abnormal in patients with schizophrenia. And perhaps some of these might be in operation in the self-writing that you're talking about. Very often, some of these are associated with epileptic states, wherein individuals uh, have these experiences of hypergraphia and all of that, either during the epileptic episode or as a personality change related to long-standing epilepsy. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Uh, Professor Madhu Khanna. Thank you. I'm a trained endologist, and my question is uh, addressed to Dr. Owen. Um, I was fascinated by the classifications, but I was wondering why gender has not entered your interpretation because women experience the world differently, and I'm sure all the women here would in the in the room would um, uh, would accept that, and they have a very different um, uh, sort of a construction of the self. And my second part of my question is that um, alternative states of the self when the socially constructed identity fades. And that's something that we know from the lives of saints and, you know, even philosophers and even Carl Gustav Jung. I mean, I was wondering why you didn't bring him in. But it was a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very interested in gender differences, and that's just an area that I don't talk about here. It's actually quite interesting, the politics of talking about gender in the... In the 90s, uh, 80s and 90s, there was a lot of discussion about gender differences in ethical reasoning in America, and I wrote a lot about that. And for this recent book, I went back and I wrote all my friends, all my feminist philosopher friends, and I said, what's going on now on gender and moral psychology? They said, no one's willing to touch that with a 10-foot pole. And I'm serious. That was the, that's what I got back from everyone. So it's disturbing to me, since I really depend on what the human scientists teach me if something is suddenly not allowed. So I, I was interested in that. But I happened, there are places in which I'm very interested in that. Your other question, could you just state it again, the part about alternative, like? Alternative selves, you know, when the socially constructed identity uh, disappears, you know, I mean, all these identities are socially constructed, whatever you've spoken about. So when you look at the lives of saints and, you know, um, they have very rich experiences of transcendence, so right. what happens to the self then? That's right. Yeah, so these are really uh, great questions. I mean, I take it that at the end of the day, I'll just, I'll, I've been kind of, uh, at the end of the day, what, we'll all, what we all really want the most is to understand the relationship between the phenomenology of experience, culture, the brain and the body, and our behavior. I call that the natural method. It's just bringing together all the knowledge and have the arrows running in every direction. And then we're going to get a phenomenology of what it's like to be a dog, what it's like to be a cat, your average dog and cat, what it's like to be autistic. Your av but there'll be huge individual variation. And I take it that part of what happens when people, you know, there is some, I, I could ask my colleagues here, uh, I know that in certain cultures um, there's talk that schizophrenia uh, usually the schizophrenic, at least in the places like I have visited in the Amazon, 
is usually the shaman. And you take ayahuasca with him. <laughs> and he says crazy things. And you say, that's terrific. He's amazing. He's transcending normal experience. So um, this thirst for novelty, for novel ways of constructing the self, I think that's a very, very um, important element in self, being a self. Can I add one line? I think that we can We'll talk later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roman. Uh, please uh, introduce yourself, please. Hello, I'm Pankaj. I'm a philosophy student, PhD student at IIT Kanpur. Is the Mic microphone working there? Yeah. Uh, speak hi. To you. Yeah. My question is to Dr. John. Uh, while your talk, uh, uh, three pictures occurred to me. One picture is of uh, insane uh, criminals, those who claim that uh, there was some vices that made him do whatever they did. Second picture was so-called spiritual leaders, godmen, and sages that they claim that they can communicate with the, so through voices with the, they claim themselves as being prophet uh, to God. And third picture was of myself that sometimes when I am expecting someone's call, I hallucinate about <coughs> ringing the bell. So is there any degree of uh, uh, schizophrenia or uh, criteria to term it to be clinical? And the second uh, question is added to that. While your uh, experiments, uh, you said that in superior parietal lobe and the number of connections were uh, played very important role in determining the demarcation between healthy person and the schizophrenic one. I want to ask, did you come across any healthy person having same neural structure as of schizophrenia, uh, having same superior parietal lobe and the number of connection as uh, in a schizophrenic person. I'll start with you. To just reassure that uh, the experiences that you have uh, do not come under the typical schizophrenic experiences. What you have is uh, something that most people, most people who do not suffer from schizophrenia share, which is referred to as a pseudo hallucination. This is uh, sometimes it, it could also be potentially imagery. We, as uh, teachers, we usually teach our students how to differentiate between true hallucinations and pseudo hallucinations in imagery, just to make sure that we don't end up labeling people who have normal experiences with having schizophrenia. Uh, the issue of uh, the uh, the mentally ill criminal patients, uh, you know, people who, on account of mental illness, com commit certain criminal acts uh, for which they either land up in jail or very often. I think uh, recently I attended a talk where uh, I was told that, you know, the largest uh, mental asylum in the U.S. and other countries is the, are the jails because they are filled up with lots of patients who have psychosis and end up committing criminal activities and, you know, they uh, probably will not be able to defend themselves that they did those acts under, under the influence of a mental illness. Um, the third issue is about overlap between uh, healthy subjects and schizophrenia subjects. Uh, well, it has uh, been our contention, even though there has been a lot of research on structural uh, imaging findings in schizophrenia, it's our contention that despite about 40 years of research, we've really not been able to pinpoint a particular brain region which is abnormal in every individual with schizophrenia. And in fact, we have come up with a recent paper in the Journal of Negative Results in Biomedicine, where, wherein uh, we had uh, reported in a sample of about um, 86, uh, uh, close to 90 subjects, half of them are patients with schizophrenia and half of them are healthy subjects, and compared uh, between uh, the, the, the compared the two samples for structural characteristics using three common, most commonly used pipelines for structural brain analysis, and we did not find significant brain abnormalities. This is not to say that all other research is false, and that we ourselves, if we redo the analysis in another sample, we will not find differences. But we, what we were trying to highlight is that a structural brain abnormality is not a characteristic of schizophrenia, and that may be mediated by many other factors, including genetic, nutritional, environmental, and other factors, which might make the brain prone for development of schizophrenia later, but not a characteristic of schizophrenia. Functional connections, in the, uh, the small sample, I know that, you know, this particular uh, experiment was sort of a proof of concept, a proof of principle for that novel task 
to uh, you know look at connectivity abnormalities during the experience of uh, auditory hallucinations at least in this sample there were the um, even even when you are looking at the individual subjects you don't see the hyper connection in the superior parietal lobule which is the, which is what gives us hope that perhaps this could be considered as a neural signature of the experience of auditory hallucinations but uh, to give you a definitive answer perhaps in the next conference we might have the data in a larger sample and perhaps we can interact on that thank you sir hello i'm hirsch my question is to the whole panel board uh, well uh, you guys presented really interesting research uh, my question is like uh, why are we not focusing on treatments which does not include medicine or medication like uh, there was someone who asked about side effects and all like mostly in schizophrenia we give antipsychotics or dopamine antagonists uh, so uh, basically if you see those people can be good at other things like ma'am uh, pratibha ma'am said like there is like creative autism like people are good at music music or people are good at uh, other things uh, so like why are we not fo uh, focusing on that side like uh, because uh, uh, maybe like it's not uh, pe uh, the person has the patient has schizophrenia and it's not harming either the it's not harming either the uh, anyone else or there's no self harm he's not harming himself also but uh, he's he's doing a lot like he's producing or if he's a musician he's producing music or whatever he is doing is really good at it so why do we yeah i think that's a very important point i think uh, we should not uh, just focus our treatment on just pharmacology and that is not what we do i mean we will not uh, in, at nimhans or m most other places where it is possible to have a holistic approach a more comprehensive treatment plan they usually uh, admin, i mean uh, offer the patients a comprehensive care of course especially in a center like nimhans where we have a multidisciplinary approach we for every individual there is a comprehensive care it is just that in this talk we are focused on those scans but when it comes to the individual patient it is about helping the individual deal with his symptoms and get, getting the best out of him through a personalized psychosocial rehabilitation program okay, okay i think uh, what we'll do is we'll have both of you ask the questions and then we will get back to the panel so you please introduce and hello hello everyone all the panelists my name is mehak i am a phd scholar at department of philosophy delhi university my question is directed both to dr rao and to dr john uh, in schizophrenic cases where the patient is able to report that i was doing something but i wasn't able to control it can we say that there are two senses of self that are working simultaneously because uh, that and in that specific case the patient has two senses of self but is able to own up to only one so there might be a problem of ownership that is uh, coming into play in those cases so i would want your comments on that we'll, we'll get Thank back you. to your response in a minute yes please please introduce yourself my name is pooja soni and my question is if self uh, were to be an agency interested in performing one task and uh, over time that task leads to depression wouldn't the self be stuck or become dysfunctional in terms of uh, performing another task suppose you are stuck in one task and your self is here and you are not interested in doing some other task and uh, and as we all know we are um, practice driven performers if time uh, if by the time i realize uh, by the time the person realizes he ha he has depression um, relative to one task and uh, the time to perform the next task is just commercing uh then wouldn't uh, the self become dysfunctional or the the symptoms of uh, schizophrenia or attention disorders uh wouldn't they arise as a result of that and my other question is do no, you see please, a cause please let us take one question we are really please running out of time a brief question from you please and then we'll get back to the responses i'm hamsa teaching psychology in mount carmel college bangalore my question is for dr pratibha karant ma'am you spoke about many high functioning autistic individuals 
but a large uh, majority of them uh, with severe autism. Uh, what do you think is their level of consciousness? Thank you. Right. Thank you. I spoke about high functioning uh, uh, individuals with autism, uh, not as a large majority. They are less than 20 percent. So it is a minority. And um, uh, you wanted to know how severe their autism or their awareness of self? Yeah. Who have severe autistic features? Yeah. What is their level of consciousness? Yeah. I, I don't think we know at all because they have not had the opportunity to really express it. It's only in the small group of people who are so-called breaking through their autism or really finding a means of communicating. See, all of these were nonverbal for a very long time and they find a way of communicating and technology has really played a role there because they watch others, you know, typing. And I said a lot of them are hyperlexic. They're totally, you know, nonverbal, but they're hyperlexic and they try this either accidentally or after observing that, you know, this is a means of communication. So we are learning about them now. So in a way, it's just a few individuals who are really now talking about it. If I understand the questions related to self well, um, I, I think uh, the first question was about the potential presence of two selves. Uh, within uh, the minds of a patient with schizophrenia who has, uh, uh, let's say, a delusion of control. Someone is controlling uh, him or her. Now, I think it's a very important issue. That's the issue that we are, uh, that's the issue at stake here. That's the issue that we are chasing. We are expected to have only one self, a unitary self. And the self is expected to be integrated uh, with, within, within oneself and integrated with the background, family, society, everything. But it should be a unitary self. And when there is a break in that unity, uh, which is, that is when we look, I mean, the patient might into, uh, experience psychopathology, one of, which, uh, some of, one of which may be hallucinations, wherein the individual has the perception as, as normal as it is for any other uh, individual without schizophrenia. But the individual attributes that uh, to uh, an external agent. Obviously, we all know that there is no source of this stimulus. However, so that it could be either a subvocal speech or it could be a thought. It could be an emotion, which or a combination of all of this, which might be experienced as a hallucination. Uh, the subvocal speech hypothesis has largely been discounted, so we are left with the thought within the individual, a memory within the individual. So, uh, so obviously having two selves is abnormal and we are trying to look at the neural correlate of that, uh, the second self. And uh, in, in the experiment on the auditory hallucinations, we are getting some leads, whether, uh, uh, and this is in continuation with our understanding of the normal self, which is, I showed uh, the, the brain circuits which are involved in the normal self, and we have looked at those very structures, and then found that at least in a particular connection, there is a deviant connection, a hyperconnectivity, which, in, which uh, results in an increased connectivity with the auditory cortex, you know, from where you perceive the sound, and perhaps that could be a, an explanation. And that is where this field moves. I think we need, we probably, hopefully, would be able to find out the neural correlates of the second self. Regarding the second question, from uh, if I have understood correctly, is there a problem of uh, an individual moving from a particular task to another task, in, uh, be it an individual with uh, schizophrenia or depression? I think that is, uh, set shifting is uh, considered to be an important executive function predominantly mediated by the prefrontal networks, and that has been shown to be abnormal both in patients with schizophrenia and in patients with depression, while, especially while they are in the face of depression. So inability to move from a particular uh, cognitive activity and then that particular cognitive activity having a smooth flow into the next cognitive activity to continue on with a meaningful uh, action reaching towards the goal. So that kind of goal-oriented activity uh, is known to be affected in patients with schizophrenia and depression. I, I hope I've answered what you wanted uh, to ask. Thank you very much. Uh, 
just like you, I too wish that this session continued and we could uh, discuss and discuss and finally have that person called self somewhere here and presenting itself or himself or herself to us, but that I, I guess that's not going to be the case. I think personally this, ha this was one of the most fascinating sessions I have listened to and with such luminary sitting here. Uh, you know, to go deep into such a complex concept. Thank you so much, all, all of the panelists. Uh, well, while we go for the lunch, let me leave you with a few questions, which I think are very fascinating, which have come out of all the four presentations. Is there a deeper sense to the experience of self beyond a continuity which is given by traces of memory and cultural practices? Is the self bound by outlines of body one has to draw continuously in the case of an autistic child? Or is it something beyond the control of the body and the mind in the case of a schizophrenic? What are the constituents of self? How is the self constituted? Are the degrees in our cognitive capabilities, social cognition, ability to imagine, ability to have a sense of hope and dream for the future is going to design our experience of an enduring self? And I think finally, which is a question which I'm personally very interested, how are the self and neural processes intertwined? Because I think today's world, we just cannot escape that question. Well, I think all these questions, once again, uh, remind us the three larger frameworks which uh, Owen Flanagan presented to us very beautifully, which is these three frameworks are going to tell us perhaps much more about the self. And we need to be aware that we are using frameworks in conceptualizing self. One is we have the ability to universalize or the metaphysical notions and the psychological characteristics of the self. And the other is the normative self variations, which is given through values of a sense of morality, our idea of God and our idea of transcendence, etc. And the other, the third is the epistemic or the differences in the way we know and uh, speak accurately about oneself and the other selves. I think these three frameworks are going to influence the various questions which we uh, just narrated a few minutes back. Uh, so. This is going to be a complex world, and this is going to be a complex experience for all of us, because I think self is the most fascinating, uh, just not a concept. I think that is the hope and dream. And without self, I don't think we'll be move, we will be able to move forward. So, so uh, let me end this session. And uh, we now break for the lunch, and we come back at 2.15.